second scripture reading is from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, 5 through 6, and 8 through 10. When the seventh month came, and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women, and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak until noon, as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And all the people lifted their hands in response. Amen. Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They read from the book of the law of God making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and teacher of the law, and the Levites, who were instructing the people, said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. This, my friends, is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. The Bible. The word, we call it, because the words in this book were inspired by God. Really, the Bible is not one book, but a whole bunch of books put together. The ancient Hebrews divided the Old Testament into several categories. The first five books are called the Law. And these were followed by books that described the history of Judah and Israel. And finally came the Prophets. Now, this doesn't mean that a prophetic book will not contain history, or that a history book will not contain theological ideas. But what it does mean is that each book carries its own kind of content that has to be read and understood in light of its purpose. The New Testament has a similar division of content. It starts with the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are really four biographies of Jesus written from different perspectives. Then there's the book of Acts, which is largely a history of the church in apostolic times. Then we have the epistles or letters, which is basically the correspondence of early evangelists of the church. And finally, we have a full-blown prophetic work called the book of Revelation. And here again, you will find an overlap of content from several genres. I think we as Christians can view the books of the Bible as having varying degrees of importance. For example, Paul's letter to the Romans has huge importance for Christian theology, while the book of Esther, the story of a concubine and wife of a Persian king, is seldom read for its theological insights in modern times. Though the Bible is for us a holy and hugely complex accumulation of writings written for specific purposes in a specific time. Each part of it has something to say to us in our own time and in our own context. Now in our Thursday morning Bible studies I've been bouncing from book to book partly to give people a sense of this. So the Bible is a book that we revere as God's word to us yesterday, today, and always. Now, when I was a very young boy, my daughter's not covering her face yet, <laughs> perhaps five or six years of old that I was at the time, my father was an enlisted man in the Air Force. And there were four of us children. And we lived in a trailer house. 
that was 8 feet wide by about 32 feet in length. Yes, it was cozy, but we didn't have too many possessions, you know, to clutter things up. Even so, my parents made sure there was one prized possession in that trailer house, and that possession was the family Bible. And this was, and still is, a huge <coughs> tome. It must have cost my dad a month of his salary. It had a leather cover with red letterings for the words of Jesus. It had a family tree on the inside of both covers. The maps of the Holy Land were included. And what proved to be hugely fascinating to us kids was a section in the middle of the book that contained pictures of famous paintings of Bible scenes from the masters of the Renaissance. Now, I specifically remember the picture. My favorite was this vast depiction of a chaotic battlefield with David standing over the supine Goliath, holding Goliath's sword in his hand. Now reflecting back on this now, I find most remarkable that my parents allowed us to peruse this expensive and highly valued item as often as we liked even though we weren't even school age yet. And we did. We would sit on a sofa that was nearly as wide as the trailer and <laughs> examine those paintings over and over again, asking questions that I don't think my mom was completely prepared to answer. But she would answer them as best she could and tell us Bible stories that she had learned when she was young that went some way to explaining the pictures and went some way to clarifying for us children what this giant book really meant to our lives. Now this relic, this Bible, is still kept by my parents. And the last time I saw it, it was in pretty rough condition. With a frayed cover, a few torn pages, and perhaps a few crayon marks here and there. There was just one thing that we were not allowed to do with this family Bible. We were not allowed to put another book on top of it. Wherever the book was, it could be seen. No other book was given precedence over it. To this day, I seldom will put another book on top of a Bible, unless for the expediency of the moment, to carry it around or put it in a box when you're moving or something like that. And I think this freedom we were given with something so valuable has influenced me to this very day. And it highlights something about the Word of God that we should all have access to it. And we should be as familiar with it as is possible. I think being this close to the Word, though I could hardly read it at the time, made me comfortable with it, made me feel closer to it. However, I must say that I understood very little about God and theology from all of this perusing. It was only later, after years of Bible study and four years of seminary, that I began to have the audacity to think that I had an inkling of what it all meant. All this, I hate to tell you, is only a prologue to our analysis of the reading to Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah is actually an historical document written by a Jew who had returned to Jerusalem and was made a kind of governor over the region by Artaxerxes, the ruler of Persia. Many Jews had returned from Babylon with him, and Nehemiah was in the midst of rebuilding the walls of the city and was bound and determined to bring faith back to Judea. Part of this was to remind the people of who they were and what they believed in. One step in doing this was to have the priest Ezra read the law at this special celebration. And we think of the law, which was read, as maybe perhaps had been the book of Deuteronomy, and it might have been pieces of the whole Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. You know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. No wonder the reading of that book took from sunrise until noon. 
We are also told the people listened attentively, and Ezra must have had a powerful voice to project it out onto the square to perhaps thousands of people who were listening. Now you're going to notice as we go over this reading that what happened there in Jerusalem is very similar to what we do in church every Sunday. Ezra stood on a wooden platform speaking to the crowd. And the first thing he did was praise the Lord. It's kind of like what we do when we begin a service and have our call to worship. And the people cried out, Amen! Amen! And you know what Amen means? It means, so be it. Then came the day's main event, a reading of the Word. These were the unfiltered words taken directly from Scripture. And what did Ezra do? He made the word clear and gave the reading meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. In essence, he gave a sermon on the word, explaining it, proclaiming it, making it applicable to the world in which those people lived. So we find that even in those ancient times, the word was central not only to a service where God was worshipped, but also to the life of the people. Now these people had come all the way back from Babylon to rebuild Jerusalem. They had come because they believed that Jerusalem was a holy city and they were doing God's will. They believed that because they had read the word and they came back to hear the word in this holy place, in their joy at hearing the word, and in their sorrow at having found the city in a state of disrepair on their return, they went. And Ezra told them that they should not weep. He told them, this day is holy to the Lord your God. And when the reading of the word and the proclamation of the word had been completed, Nehemiah the governor stepped up and told the people, go and enjoy choice food and drink, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so there was fellowship afterwards. Now this celebration does sound a lot like our own services. We worship and praise God, we read the word, we proclaim the word, we have fellowship. But what's interesting is that the form our services take is not consciously based on this celebration found in Nehemiah. And I think the reason there are so many similarities is that for we who take a reformed view of the faith, the word is certainly central, and this is a natural form for a service to take. In the same way as when I was a boy, and I could lay my hands on the Bible whenever I wanted, we as Christians believe that the Bible, God's word, should be accessible to all. Sure, this means having Bibles in the pews, Bibles in every home. It means reading books about the Bible, understanding various genres and backgrounds. It means engaging in close reading and study and investigating the comments of those who have spent their lives digging deeply into the Bible and its meaning. But I think Ezra's marathon reading of the law points up something else. There's more in understanding the word than each of us simply reading the Bible on our own. It's important the word is to be shared audibly with each other, both directly from the Bible and then in discussion and interpretation of it. There's something in the audible proclamation that brings the word home to us. It's like when my brother and sisters and I would ask questions about the Bible and my mother would tell us stories. It was not the pictures of paintings that illuminated our hearts and minds. It was the stories my mother told us and read to us. It was her audible musings that illuminated our minds. This, my friends, is not a mere plug to get you to listen to my sermons <laughs> and ever come to Bible study, but it's more a plea that first you take the word seriously, to read it diligently, and then, then, Find someone to talk to about it, because it is that interaction that is going to bring you understanding. 
at least as far as we can understand the wonder that is our God. It isn't sharing the word that its true meaning is revealed, because its whole purpose is to bring us closer to one another, and then all of us together closer to the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Please bow your heads and pray with me. <laughs> Eternal and ever-living God, the message of your word is that we should love you with all our hearts, all our souls, and all our minds, and love our neighbors as ourselves. We ask that you give us the strength and courage to do this in a way that is thoughtful as well as kind. Guide us by your holy word as we move into the future ever closer to you. Amen. Amen.